All right. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Dennis Christian. I am a chief scientific officer at Nebigo Genomics, and I'm happy to be here today to tell you a bit about uh, our work on uh, combining genomics and blockchain in order to address some of the obstacles that um, the field of genomics has been or still is facing. So the foundation of what we're doing is was essentially laid about 10 years ago, actually about the same time blockchain or Bitcoin was invented. And the foundation is what's called next generation DNA sequencing. Uh, when the first genome, when the first human genome was sequenced in 2000, 2001, the whole process took over 10 years and it cost $3 billion. If that, if that price, um, you know, didn't decrease, then we wouldn't be talking about genomics today. But fortunately, what happened over the past uh, 15 years is a hyper exponential decrease in price as sequencing technology advanced. So we went down from um, from $3 billion to less than $1,000 today, making personal genome sequencing affordable to many people. And this naturally uh, opens up a lot of opportunities for individuals who can get sequenced to learn about various issues like health risks, medications they should take, uh, whether they are carriers of certain genetic conditions and so on. But uh, it also creates opportunities for pharma companies who are increasingly interested in uh, accessing genomic data sets and using that data to facilitating drug development at different stages of the drug development cycle. And because of that, there has this an increasing interest in the industry of getting access to a uh, genomic data set, data sets. So those are just a few examples of, you know, publicly known deals that happened over the past few years. Uh, most recently, in uh, just a few months ago, there was an announcement that GSK, a big, big pharma company, uh, invested $300 million in 23andMe, uh, which is currently one of the leading personal genomics companies to get access to their, to, their, to their genetic data of their customers. And I briefly touched on different opportunities that exist. Uh, this is just a more comprehensive overview. So for patients and consumers, from, from sequencing your genome, you can learn about disease risk and uh, increasingly be able to take preventive actions to actually not get sick. Um, you can also learn about pharmacogenomics, which means that you can learn which drugs you should take and which, which drugs you should not take because you are at risk of having side effects. Uh, and then you can also do something called carrier screening, which essentially means finding out uh, which, uh, which uh, pathological genetic variants you have that do not cause a disease in you, but might cause a disease in your children if your partner also happens to have uh, such a variant. And for pharma biotech companies, there are several opportunities as well. Drug discovery is one. Um, so really do rational drug discoveries and just essentially random screens as it's co still commonly done today to identify those genes that are associated with certain medical conditions and then designing uh, drugs that modulate the activity of those genes. Um, then genomic data can also be leveraged directly during clinical trials. As mentioned during the previous talks, uh, during the previous talks, the costs of drug development are very high and getting higher uh, because more and more drugs fail through clinical trials. And one potential approach to addressing this issue is really not uh, recruiting people for those trials who are more likely to actually uh, have a positive response to the drug. So people who the drugs were more likely to work on. Uh, so the basic idea is just consider those people's genomic data when recruiting them and pick them based on that. So really, uh, build drugs that take into consideration people, people genetics. And um, genetics can also be used, or genomic data sets can also be used for what's called post-marketing surveillance, when co companies look at what side effects occur and how efficient the drugs are in different populations of people. But there are currently a few problems surrounding uh, utilization or generation and sharing and utilization of, of genomic data um, that are summarized on this slide. Uh, first of all, uh, there's, uh, and those problems are on both sides, on the side of 
patients, consumers, as well as uh, on the side of the pharma and biotech companies. What we have as patients and consumers today is that um, essentially not enough people are getting sequenced. So if I asked, like now all of you, who of you has ever used a genetic test or, or sequenced your whole genome? Maybe you just can raise your hand. How many people know the genome? Like two people. And I assume it's also probably not proper whole genome sequencing, but rather one of those cheaper tests that look at only like small fraction of your genome. So that's a problem. Uh, it's, it's already affordable today. Uh, and you can learn a lot from it, a lot of useful information, yet you're still not doing it. Um, so we need to fix that. Um, and uh, we're essentially trying, what, we, what we're building is essentially our main goal is really incentivizing more people uh, to get sequenced and to share the data. Uh, and one core problem is that people still have to pay um, for their data, uh, for, 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 for learning their genetics, and most people just don't see the value of it or they're not aware of the opportunities. Um, then another issue is how many personal genomics companies today operate. So the business model revolves around essentially collecting their customers' genetic data and then monetizing it themselves. Uh, and what this means is that those people, to some extent, just lose ownership of, of the uh, genetic data and have no control over who gets to see it and for what purpose it's used. And this lack of control and transparency um, just, just is not acceptable to many people. And um, given that system, it's also often not clear how exactly the data is protected and who's responsible for protecting it or if it's protected at all. Um, and when companies monetize this collected data, they do not compensate the actual data owners or the individuals, um, which is another issue. So all those, all those things essentially leads to the result of the survey that I just did that has shown that uh, very few people are, are getting sequenced and sharing the data. Uh, but this model that we have here, um, that essentially just, just shows this flow through these personal genomics companies, which act as middlemen, uh, also creates co problems for pharma and biotech companies. Um, first of all, the issues with consumers that I just described lead just to the general lack of data. But this is uh, made even worse by the fact that we have then such data silos. Essentially, every personal genomics company becomes a data silo, and they don't share the data among each other, and they often have data in different formats. Uh, which makes it for uh, researchers very difficult to access data that they want. Um, and uh, because of, due to those middlemen, uh, researchers also don't have direct access to patients and consumers. Uh, it, it becomes more difficult to, for example, ask for additional information that is required uh, uh, to, to for, the, for the studies. And prices increase as well. Uh, those middlemen, you know, they want to make profits at as high as possible and they're charging accordingly for the data. And there are all possible challenges associated just in uh, this handling of genomic data related to just retrieving it, storing it, uh, analyzing it, uh, which I will briefly talk about as well. So this is a survey we did ourselves, um, and its results are similar to other surveys too. Um, uh, as expected, you know, very few people responded to have actually already used any kind of genetic test, only 2%. Uh, for most people, they just consider it too expensive or just not worse for what it offers. Uh, about a third, 29%. Another, twen another third have privacy concerns and, um, and the remaining people have all different other kinds of, of issues. And then in terms of cost, many people really think that, you know, $1,000 is too much. And how m what they're willing to pay is about $100, which is what today uh, those cheaper genetic tests uh, usually cost, but they are much less comprehensive and the results are much less useful to both the individuals as well as the researchers who want to use the data. Um, then the data access issue, as I mentioned before, data fragmentation uh, is one issue. There's those for for profit biobanks that have their own data sets. There are non profit biobanks that also have their own data sets. And there's no, uh, currently, there's no sharing between those happening, even in some cases when they're just, you know, publicly available online, like for example, for the Personal Genome Project. 
uh, it's they're still o often uh, not not you know integrated or are not integrated and it's difficult to make them interoperable. Uh, then genomic data, at least the raw genomic data when it comes out of sequencing machines, it's pretty big. It's about 200 gigabytes per person, so it's really difficult to just you know send it around on the internet uh, due to this data size. Um, then there's a lack of automation. So as a researcher who wants to access a larger data set, uh, it means that you have to manually go out to those different uh, biobanks, talk with uh, someone there, ask what data they have, tell them what you need, negotiate prices, and so on, transfer payments after that, sign contracts. So it's a very manual process. It just makes it very difficult and slow to, to collect data. When we spoke with pharma companies, how long just that takes them to uh, collect data, what we heard is that just a half a year to just to just get the data that they need. Um, then there are regulatory restrictions when it comes to accessing data. For example, some countries like China are quite strict about it and simply do not allow uh, genomic data of Chinese citizens to leave country borders. So all genomic data of Chinese citizens has to be stored in China, which ob obviously makes it difficult for like any kind of non-Chinese Western company to access this data. And of course, privacy risk as well, whether perceived or real, uh, they just deter people from you know, participating in any kind of data generation or sharing efforts. And when it comes, assuming you actually acquired the data that you want, and then you want to store it, manage it, analyze it, there are a number of other issues you have to deal with. Um, storage space is one, genomic data is quite big, at least the raw genomic data. Uh, so the, uh, as of now, I think the biggest source of data that we generate, I, I believe like YouTube and, and Twitter is also pretty big. So text data and video data are pretty big. But there are some predictions saying that genomics are going to take off, took over, and you know, be the biggest data source that we will be generating uh, in, in the coming decade. Uh, so it's predicted that by 2020, we'll be talking about exabytes and by 2025 about zettabytes of, of data. And you need to store this data somewhere, so that's a problem. Uh, and obviously then you also need to compute power to process all those data. Some of the typical algorithms that are executed on genomic data are quite resource intensive. Uh, so adi in addition to storage, you also need a lot of compute power. And when you do analyze the data and you're dealing with large data sets, uh, it's always a question how to organize the data, how to keep track of what you're doing, how to make all the results reproducible, and so on. So those are issues as well. Now, after talking for a while about all the different problems, I want to uh, tell you about what we think can help address these issues. So this is a model uh, that we are proposing and are working on implementing. What it essentially is, it's a, it's a network, a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, that, that uses blockchain uh, and that co connects, that consists of individuals, which can be consumers, which can be patients, but also existing uh, databases. And it connects all of them on a single network and makes them essentially accessible to uh, researchers in, at pharma biotech companies or, um, or in academia. So what those researchers can do, uh, they can query what data is available, uh, figure out what they need uh, by you know, sending, uh, sending uh, you know, queries to the network, and then they actually also can compute on that data without moving that data out of, of the platform, of the system. So it's a, it's a distributed computing uh, platform. So they just submit their workflows, they make payments, and then get, get results back. And what, what this arrangement enables uh, is a number of benefits for both patients and consumers, as well as pharma and biotech companies. For patients and consumers, uh, it means that th having this kind of direct connection with researchers uh, means that um, when the researcher comes in, and let's say the data that he looks for is not there yet, he can actually subsidize the sequencing costs, or even fully pay the sequencing costs of that individual. So for people, it creates an opportunity to get sequenced at a much lower price, or potentially even for free. Um, then they also stay in control of the data and can decide who they want to share it with. And when they do so, do it very transparently, and that's what blockchain can help with, which I will talk uh, a bit more about later. Um, and this whole model of keeping the data in place uh, also contributes to data privacy since, uh, since, since access to data can be restricted by the individuals themselves. 
And obviously, individuals can then also get compensated for data sharing. So this, uh, this, this platform can function as a marketplace. Uh, we think that many people will share the data for altruistic reasons, simply because they want to support uh, biomedical research and drug development, but they have the opportunity to monetize the data as well. And all this will, we believe, lead, lead to an increasing genomic data availability. Um, for pharma and biotech companies, the system can function as we call it end-to-end -end genomics uh, service platform. So a researcher just comes in, queries the network, uh, finds the people who are of interest for the study. Uh, if the data is already there, pays for access, uh, then access the data, computes on it, gets results. If the data is not there yet, subsidizes sequencing costs, the data is generated, then accesses the data and, and, and analyzes it. Um, and it also enables faster access to data uh, because what we hope to create is really you know, a single network with a single you know, point of access where researchers can go and get access to a much larger data set and through that address all those issues about data fragmentation and data silos. What it also offers is direct access to patients and consumers. Uh, so it's not just about you know, dead data, but actual access to, to a person behind the data and dynamic data generation. So when a researcher wants to know additional things that are necessary to conduct a certain study, he can just go ahead and do a survey or just send a direct message to that, to that individual on the network. Um, and you know, removing the middleman also makes consent management much easier, which is right now quite an issue when it comes to health data in general. Um, blockchain, which is, you know, as you know, an immutable public ledger, it's very well suited for just managing uh, access control and consent. Um, so individuals can just add entries to it, saying, I allow my data to be used by that researcher for that purpose. Then it's immediately visible to all participants. And then this concept can re be revoked later by adding just another entry to the blockchain. So this just illustrates uh, the genomic data generation part, uh, which is quite important uh, because you know most people have not been sequenced to date, so the data is simply not there. Actually, generating the data is a core of our mission, uh, and uh, we, we we think we can automate and parallelize. Uh, and make this data generation more efficient through blockchain and smart contracts. So, you know, data buyers, researchers can just query the network, identify people who they're interested in, uh, then deposit a certain amount of tokens in a smart contract. Um, this can then be uh, um, accepted by those individuals through execution of that smart contract. And the tokens are transferred to a sequencing facility that it is generated and then made accessible to both uh, the individuals who, the be who it belongs to, as well as the researchers who paid for the, uh, for the data generation. Um, this illustrates how the platform um, looks and works like. So there's essentially s three components to it. Uh, the first one is the storage system. So without going into much detail, we're using a distributed storage system that um, essentially supports all available clouds, you know, like Amazon, AWS, Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft's Azure Cloud, and so on. So the data can be distributed across all those different clouds, stored there securely, encrypted in an encrypted form, um, and um, be computed on, which is the second component of the system. So it's a distributed computing platform that manages workflows in such a federated environment where the data is stored in different places. And it, use, it uses uh, different common standards for, uh, for computing and uh, yeah, integrating different bioinformatic tools. Um, and it supports, because of that, all those important things like uh, version control and reproducibility uh, and so on. Yeah, so important thing is that blockchain is used for consent management, access management, the data itself is stored off chain um, because obviously blockchain is not suitable for storing, you know, petabytes and of data. And the third part is actually our blockchain that fulfills several um, several functions. As I just said, it mainly consent management. It eliminates middlemen and creates this public immutable or, or like append-only database. Um, through smart contracts, it enables fast parallelized data uh, 
data purchases. And uh, the concept of uh, the data access can essentially be managed by m multiple parties who hold, who call, who, who, who hold uh, split keys so that there's no single party relying on um, just so that, so that individuals don't rely essentially on a single party to just manage access to the data. So this essentially just distributes trust across a large number of, of network participants. Um, and then again, once the data is generated, data access can be purchased. Again, smart contracts, um, similar to the data generation scheme um, where payments are made, uh, accepted, and then uh, the blockchain, so-called validator nodes, they just collectively decrypt the data. Each of those nodes holds a key share and then makes the data accessible to researchers uh, who can compute on it. And data protection is very important to us. And I touched on those different properties of the system that ensure data protection. Here they are again summarized. Uh, one is just distributed storage and computing bringing computations to the data instead of sending the data to someone. Uh, that obviously um, in helps protect data privacy because it, it, data can be analyzed in a controlled environment. Um, so what I haven't spoken about at all today is privacy and cancer technologies that we're using. Uh, for example, right now we have a, uh, we're working on a um, homomorphic encryption based uh, scheme that enables the data to remain encrypted while it's being queried. Uh, and later we look to add additional computations on encrypted data, especially genome-wide association studies. And then blockchain technology, of course, also adds to data protection as it enables a very transparent way of data sharing, data access sharing, multi-party data access control, and also governance of the whole network that incentivizes all participants to govern the network in such a way that, uh, that uh, maximizes data privacy and protection. And what we're hoping to achieve by, uh, by doing all this is essentially network growth driven by different factors. Sequencing costs, first of all, will keep uh, going down, which will make it more and more affordable to get sequenced, where the people can, people can either pay themselves or researchers can come in and pay the costs for them. Um, then um, as, as the network grows, uh, its value will increase. It will, there will be more, more data buyers will be attracted uh, from the industry. More researchers will come in, will be willing to pay more and more for the data. And uh, as researchers also learn more about human genetics, um, it will become more and more useful to know your personal gene genetic data, and more people will be incentivized to get a uh, sequence and, and, and share the data. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, in, in the interest of time, maybe one question, and then we'll just have Roman. Um, Thank you very much. Um, do I uh, see this correctly? Your main audience for, for the whole thing is actually the uh, industry, right? Or do you see any good connection to do this in science in the open? Is there a good um, approach or applying this approach there as well? Well, I mean, researchers in academia, they obviously also use uh, I need genomic data. Uh, the research they do is just less focused on developing new drugs, but more focus on just basic understanding of human genetics. And they, we want this, want to make, we, we, we will make this network accessible to them as well. Um, but we, we, the way we think about it is that in most cases, when an individual is approached by such a researcher for academia, the, we think that individuals will be compelled to just share the data for altruistic reasons to support research, while in cases where, where they're approached by pharma biotech companies, individuals will actually be willing to wanting to monetize that data. So I think the incentives there are just a little bit different, but we want the data to be shared with both those uh, parties. Yeah. 